Hello and welcome to Thursday of week two, our lecture on the late Republic. This is a very important lecture and so I'm excited to be giving it today. Um, a very important time for Rome, this era of the late Republic. We are going to be having a very architecture heavy lecture. That is because there's a lot of architectural developments in this time um, that really become hallmarks of Roman architecture. Um, things that when you think of Rome, this is what you think of. We're going to start seeing those beginnings right now. Um, so it's going to be very architecture heavy. I hope you like architecture. If not, I hope you learn to love it by the end of this lecture. Um, and I want to say outright what these architectural developments are because you're going to hear me talking about them throughout the lecture over and over. So um, the two main architectural developments to take away are that Roman temples, which previously looked much more Etruscan, right, um, are going to start looking more Greek. That's a big change. The other thing is that we're going to see the rise of the Ionic and Corinthian orders, which previously we had seen the Doric order, right, like in Paestum, those Doric temples. We're going to now be seeing a lot more Ionic and Corinthian, and Corinthian in particular will become, uh, like I said, a hallmark of Roman architecture, something that you think of um, when you think of Roman architecture, you think of this Corinthian order. So the architectural developments are a really big piece of this lecture. The other big piece of this lecture is the historical context that is happening at this time, right? Where Rome is transitioning from a republic. It's been a republic for 500 years almost, right? Starting in 509 um, with the, the death of Lucretia that, that hearkens this period of the republic um, in 509. And then now all the way until 31 BC, um, we're going to see uh, a change, right? And we're going to see the, the end of the Republic, um, which this man on our, our right will play a big role in, Caesar. Um, and then we're going to see the rise of the empire. So these are the last, uh, the last critical moments of the Republic before we see this major, major political change. Um, but like I said, I want to start with architecture. So um, just to review again, you've seen this a lot, right? You've seen this diagram many times now. Um, so we have different types of temples, Etruscan, Roman, Greek. This is kind of fifth, fifth, sixth century uh, design here. So um, I do, yeah, again, I'm not going to uh, go into it a lot because we've talked about it a lot, but Etruscan and Roman look very similar, right? They have, they're frontally oriented, they have deep porches, and they have uh, cellas, which are often tripartite, not always, and they are not peripteral, right? So the Greek is a peripteral temple because it has columns that go all the way around it. It's like a 360 degree view. Um, and it's there's not necessarily one obvious entrance, although there is one entrance, it's not obvious. In Roman and Etruscan, very obvious where the entrance is, the columns do not go all the way around, right? They are not peripteral. The Greek is a peripteral temple. Um, so with that, I want to also talk about the orders. So we have three different orders, which are kind of like styles of temples here. Um, the Doric is the one that we looked at last time. So those are the temples in Paestum, uh, very common during the archaic uh, and classical period. Um, and that's where we have not a lot of de decoration. So it's very uh, minimalist, very, um, yeah, unornamented. We have um, uh, the base of the of the temple with the stylobate, the column just rises right out of that, right? So there's there's no uh, sort of base right here. Um, and then we have this column capital, which is also very simple, very geometric. Um, it can be either flared or it can be uh, more like a disc that we saw at Paestum, um, but there's not any ornamentation on the capital itself. Another big thing that uh, delineates Doric temples are this the frieze, the alternating triglyphs and metopes. So the triglyphs um, are these lines here, that design, and then the metope would hold some sort of image, um, usually sort of a, a narrative type image, um, and then that would repeat. So it'd be triglyph, metope, triglyph, metope. Um, in the Ionic, we start to see a change, right? So we still have the stylobate and the stereobate here, um, but we start to see a base on the columns, so they don't just rise right up. We have this sort of um, liminal space here uh, with the base, and then we see the fluting of the columns. We see decoration on the capital. So we have these um, volutes, these ionic volutes, these sort of spirals, uh, which are a decorative feature. And then the frieze does not have triglyphs and metopes. It's going to be a continuous frieze. Uh, so one long image that just flows into everything else. There's no separation there. It's just one long picture. And then here, and I'm gonna actually turn my uh, video off just in case I'm blocking it, I can't tell. Um, 
here we have the Corinthian order. So uh, not much of a, a stereobate or a stylobate, right? There's really long columns. The columns do have um, a base like you see, and then they have the, the uh, fluting on the columns and then a very decorative, very ornamented column capital with especially these vegetal elements. So whereas in the Ionic order, we see more of a, a geometric spiral, uh, we see very natural vegetal um, acanthus leaves. We do still see some volutes, but they're paired with those vegetal um, uh, uh, images. Uh, and then we also, again, we still have that continuous freeze. So it's one long image um, going across the entire facade or the entire temple. Another important thing, and it's, it's a bit confusing in this image, um, but in the Doric and Ionic orders, you see how the, uh, uh, the, the roof comes to a triangular point. So there's that triangular bit that overhangs um, and that's, uh, it doesn't overhang like an Etruscan roof, but there's just a, the, a bit of triangular uh, shape right there. In the Corinthian order, we're gonna see more of a rectangular shape and that the, although it would have a roof, so this one doesn't have a roof, which is a li little strange. So it would still have a pediment, a triangular pediment, but the it doesn't form a triangle at this corner. It forms more of a, a 90 degree angle. And so uh, we'll look at that a little more closely when we see actual temples. Here I am back again. Okay. So the first thing that I want to look at is actually not a piece of architecture necessarily. It's this sarcophagus. So the sarcophagus of uh, Lucius Cornelius Scipio Barbatus. Imagine that was your name. Yes. Romans had very long names. A lot of times they had a lot of um, family significance like we do now. Uh, this sarcophagus, sarcophagus is from 200 BC. Um, so still, you know, uh, we're going to be covering a lot of years here, so 200 is a bit early still. Uh, Rome, it's made of tufa stone, which I think I said maybe in one of the first lectures that that's a local stone to Rome, right? It's kind of the local rock there that they could quarry. Um, and if you look at this, I feel like maybe you will uh, notice already, having just seen the, the slide with the Doric and Ionic and Corinthian, you'll see some familiar elements, right? So take a minute. I just want you to look at that for just a second. Okay, so what are a few features that maybe you saw um, and that I'm gonna point out? We'll start at the bottom. So there is sort of this base, right? That base kind of looks like um, a column base, like an ionic column base, right? So we start to see that. Um, and then it's supporting this inscription here, which talks about uh, the dead. And then we have triglyphs and metopes. So we have alternating triglyphs, right? Those three lines and then metopes with some sort of uh, decorative image in the middle. It goes out, we have a cornice here. Um, I would say that's a triangular cornice. Um, and then we have these ionic volutes on top. So this is a Roman sarcophagus, right? Odd, I think, that it doesn't look like uh, a Roman temple. It's using these very Greek uh, temple forms, right? Um, uh, even, yeah, even sort of that, uh, the flat roof of it, um, the different kind of registers here that we talked about it as a Roman thing, I know, but in here it's it's, it's more mimicking the type of uh, temple style, right? So this is a very architectural and very Greek inspired sarcophagus. Um, and especially at this time period, it's strange because we've seen so much Etruscan influence in Roman temples that all of a sudden we're starting to see Greek influence, right? So we're gonna move on now to actual standing architecture. So here's a map, this is Rome in 51 BC. Um, and so it probably looks a bit different than the last map that we looked at, but there's still familiar features. So you can see the Palatine Hill here. We even have the hut of Romulus, which is that like very first image that I showed you. Here's the Forum Romanum with the Comitum. Uh, Temple of Vesta is right here, just to sort of situate you. So Palatine down to the Forum. Um, and we're gonna be starting over here in the Forum Boarium. So it looks like Orium, but he's actually separated, Boarium. Uh, and that was a, a food market. So it was a type of form, it was a type of uh, marketplace. Um, and as we'll see, Rome had many fora as the years went on, they just kept building more. <laughs> so uh, the Forum Boarium was a food market specifically for cattle um, and for beef products, right? So uh, it was sort of uh, like a wet market where you could buy cattle related 
uh, food items, I suppose. Um, it was also the original docks and port for the city of Rome. So you see its position right on the Tiber River there, um, really advantageous for shipping things in and out for trade. Um, and that was the first uh, port. It's the first one that they used early on. And overall, it was sort of this hub of commercial activity like a lot of fora are. But we're also going to see that it had um, some religious architecture there. So it was also some um, had sort of a religious center, similar to how the Forum Romanum, although it had shops, it had civic buildings, it also had religious buildings. So we really see a mix of these sort of, um, of public uh, architecture, public structures uh, all in one place. So the first one we're going to begin with is the Temple of Portunus. Uh, the date on this one is a bit wide, as you can see, <laughs> a lot of debate about how uh, how far back this dates. It could be as early as 150, could be as late as 80. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it is a late Republic, late Republican temple. And this is really interesting because it combines everything that we've seen so far. It combines Etruscan, it combines Greek, and it is in that way, the fact that it combines these two cultures so distinctively uh, makes it very Roman. It makes it its own style, right? Because we are taking so many elements from other things that at this point, it's not one or the other. It's not an Etruscan copy. It's not uh, a Greek colony, you know, like Paestum was. This is really a, a Roman temple and it's the first sort of purely Roman temple that we are really looking at um, in, in the sort of, uh, yeah, late Republic and Imperial sense of the word, right? We did have the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus and that is a Roman temple because it was built by the Romans, but in its form, it looked very Etruscan and this is gonna be looking different. Um, so the first thing that I wanna point out um, are these columns all along the sides, right? And even in the back, they continue in the back as well as you can see on the plan. Um, but this does not make it a peripteral temple, right? So in Greek, temples, you might be thinking, oh, well, the columns went all the way around it. That's a peripteral temple. I've, I've learned that. Um, <laughs> it's deep in my knowledge now. Um, well, <laughs> when you have columns that are going all the way around, but they're not freestanding, they're engaged. So engaged columns mean that they are touching a wall. They're attached to a wall. Um, they're engaged to that wall, right? They're right up against it. And you can see that here. So this would be a freestanding column, and these would be engaged columns. The fact that we have some type of column going all the way around, but they are not all freestanding columns, makes this a pseudo peripteral temple. And this is a, a purely Roman design. Uh, the fact that it's sort of Greek, it's sort of Greek where it's taking that peripteral idea, um, but it's not putting them all the way around. So it's still, it's, it's not purely a Greek form. Uh, pseudo peripteral temple, right, with those engaged columns. Um, another thing that we see, though, is that we see still it has a very, uh, it's a very frontally oriented temple, it has a very frontal axis. So it has this staircase out in front that we see in Etruscan temples originally, and we see imported into Rome. Uh, this staircase out in front, you know exactly where to enter, right? So it's not like a Greek temple where it has steps all the way around the side. It's only in the front. That's the only place you can enter. But it is raised above uh, the ground, right? So it does sit on this uh, sort of stylobate-esque type uh, platform, okay? Something else, uh, the column capitals. What kind of column capitals are those? Ionic, right? So those are ionic column capitals uh, with the volutes, those swirling volutes always show you uh, that it's ionic and you can also tell because um, they're sitting on bases here, right? So the fact that uh, the columns don't go all the way into the ground, that's not a Doric temple, this is gonna be ionic. But nonetheless, that is a Greek form. It comes from Ionia, which is a, a area of the Greek world in this time. Uh, so the fact that it is an Ionic column is another reference to Greece. Um, but uh, again, with those sort of, the, the staircase is very Etruscan slash Roman, the uh, engaged columns, not purely Greek. Um, there's not much pedimental uh, sculpture or decoration on this. Um, it's still a bit minimalist, so it is uh, kind of getting into the Ionic order, but it doesn't have uh, a super decorative frieze. It doesn't have a ton of pedimental sculpture. Um, so that's another thing. Um, uh, also the material, so the material is made of tufa, most of it. It's kind of a, there's a mix, I think, in this one. 
Um, yes, so it's uh, most of it is made out of the local stone, tufa that we've talked about, um, but it also has a little bit of travertine on it. Travertine is an Italian marble. So if you look at Greek temples, right, they're made with marble that is quarried from uh, Greece, from that area. Um, in uh, especially like at the ones in um, the temples on the Acropolis are made from marble that was quarried right outside Athens. Uh, here we have a similar thing. So travertine, Travertine is a type of um, marble that is from local. It's a local marble. So the fact that they're building temples out of marble is a reference to Greece, but they're not using the exact same material. They're using a Roman material. Um, the other thing is, is that they, uh, the marble is not as attractive as um, Greek marble. So travertine is not that gleaming, gleaming white that uh, those, uh, the marble that comes from the Attica, the, the Athens area is. Um, it's, it's a little bit uglier. Um, so what they do is they coated it all in white stucco. So there's this white sort of plaster that they cover the whole thing with. And it's really interesting because this temple, um, you know, is so old that you can kind of see the, the delineation between the um, the white stucco and the uh, the stone itself, right? So here, if you look at, you can see that distinction between the right the white stucco, which has been coated on, um, and then the the stone underneath is starting to show through. But in the Roman era, it would have been all white stucco. Everything would have been white, and it would have looked like a very gleaming uh, Greek temple in that sense, right? Um, so it's really uh, a really interesting temple because. It's the first time that we're seeing such a mix of all of these things that will come to define the style of Roman temples. However, we also have things in Rome that look very uh, Greek. And so the fact that that had some Etruscan influence, right? That's sort of a separate thing here. We don't see really any Etruscan influence at all anymore. This is a very Greek style. So this is the temple of Hercules Victor uh, from about 150 BC in the Forum Boarium, right? So the same place that the temple of Portunus was. Um, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned that. So the temple of Portunus was in the Forum Boarium. Uh, this one stood nearby. You can go and see both today if you go down to the Tiber in Rome. Uh, so what we have here is a tholos. So a tholos is a round, uh, circular temple. It is from uh, Greece. It's a Greek, Greek design. Um, it actually was dedicated by Lucius Mummius in uh, 146. So they, they circa 150, I guess. We're not sure exactly the year, but um, 150. Uh, in 146, uh, Lucius Mummius sacks Corinth. So Corinth is a Greek city. Um, when you're just at the top of the Peloponnese, kind of close to Athens in, the, in that area. Um, and so he sacks Corinth, he takes it for, uh, for Rome. So Rome now has control of Corinth and they're moving into the Greek world, starting to conquer Greece. And it is a manuvial structure, which means that it was built after and funded by the spoils of war. So when Rome took Corinth, they sacked it, took a lot of its, its treasure, things like that. Um, came back to Rome and used the, the materials or the, um, the treasure, the wealth that they had gained from Corinth to build this temple. So this temple, Hercules Victor, right? Um, it's, it's a reference to their victory. Um, and this type of temple also is called a Harun, which means that it is a, a temple to a hero. So it's not a temple to a god. Um, the temple of Portunus, uh, I don't think I mentioned, uh, Portunus is uh, the god of... Um, uh, harbors, right, God of Harbors, because it sits on the Tiber. So there's that port, right, that I said, the Forum Boarium is a port, um, the original port of Rome, and so Portunus is the God of Harbors, and so they built this temple in his honor on the bend of the Tiber, kind of makes sense, right, maybe they're trying to get good blessings um, for the port, you know. Uh, whereas here, though, the Temple of Hercules Victor is a, tem a, a temple to a hero, so Hercules is a hero, he's not a god necessarily, although he is deified in a way, but he's not one of sort of the original gods. He was once um, mortal, you could say. Um, so Temple of Hercules Victor, definitely a reference to the Roman sack of Corinth, their victory there. Um, and it also, that might be why it takes a lot of Greek design. So the tholos is a, um, a Greek design in its uh, in uh, temple design. Um, and I want to show you actually here. So here are some examples, right? So we have the Tholos at Delphi, uh, 380 to 370. Uh, there's not much left of either of these, but the ruins. Um, so that is, a, that is perhaps the most famous Tholos in Greece. 
um, at, at the, the uh, if you know about Delphi, that was where the Oracle was. So it was a popular uh, kind of pilgrimage site. You'd go there and talk to the Oracle and try to have her tell you your future um, or what you give advice, what you should do. Uh, so very common site, beautiful site also um, in Greece and they had a Tholos there. And then also in Knidos, um, also uh, you might've known the uh, Aphrodite of Knidos, a very famous uh, Greek statue, right? Uh, the first statue to depict a, a, a nude female goddess, uh, which was kind of scandalous at the time or kind of shocking, I guess. Um, and she would have stood that, that statue would have stood in the middle of this Tholos so that you have a 360 degree view of her. Um, interesting though, but Tholos actually does have a set of stairs. So this one, there are just um, stairs all the way around like a common Greek temple. We actually do see a staircase here um, as well as all the way around. So, uh, so to go back here, we have, stairs all the way around. So there's no frontal um, staircase. There's no frontal axis like we are so used to seeing in these Roman temples, right? Like, where do you enter it? It's, I'm not sure. It's a 360 degree view. It, it's unclear where the entrance is. It's not super frontally oriented. Although we do have an entrance, you know, you can see that here. And we, we have a cella also, so we have an open space, um, but it's unclear immediately from looking at it from this far away where that would be. Another thing, it is a uh, peripteral, right? So it has freestanding columns that go all the way around. That also adds to the, the lack of frontality, the lack of a frontal axis, the fact that we have this peripteral colonnade circling uh, the temple. Um, something else though, is that uh, it is Corinthian. So the, the capital, uh, the capitals on the columns are of the Corinthian order, um, as you might have guessed by the name, originated in Corinth, right? So Corinthian, Corinth, this was built from the spoils of the sack of Corinth. So it makes sense again that they would reference that. Um, this is uh, one of the earliest, perhaps the earliest, I'm not sure, um, use of uh, Corinthian columns in Rome and that will become sort of their preferred style, their, their preferred order of temples. We'll see a lot of um, uh, Corinthian, not exclusively Corinthian, but a lot of Corinthian as we move on. Um, it's a very, as I said, ornate decorative style. Um, anything else I want to mention here? I think that's it. Yeah, it's also built from marble. So the travertine is also um, the same material, right? So if you see that marble, we see that reference to um, Greek temples, again, in the, in the white marble um, with stucco. There we have those. Um, I want to move to another tholos. So this is the temple of Vesta in Tivoli. Again, we're seeing more Greek influence when building these round temples, which come from Greece. Um, so Tivoli is just, uh, it's sort of near Rome-ish. Um, it is, this is the Temple of Vesta. So you might remember, right? The Temple of Vesta, there's also one in the Roman Forum. Um, Vesta is the goddess of the home, of the hearth. Um, she's sort of <laughs> uh, the goddess of family, um, kind of like just, you're sitting around the fire with your family on a nice a cold evening, um, I don't know, Vesta is there. <laughs> that's sort of, that's the vibe that I get from Vesta, um, goddess of the hearth. And so that's why in um, the Roman Forum, I think I mentioned, right, they have that flame that the Vestal Virgins, her her priestesses would, would tend to, and it was the heart of the city. It represented the family of Rome, the home part of Rome, the fact that Rome is your home, it's your family. Um, those sort of elements. Um, so here we have another temple of Vesta in Tivoli, um, and this is as Greek as we've got, basically. <laughs> um, it's a tholos. Uh, we have uh, free, freestanding columns. We have a peripteral colonnade, freestanding columns around the entire structure. Uh, we do have a staircase here, though. Unlike uh, the temple of Hercules Victor, we have a staircase, so there is some reference to where you're supposed to enter. Um, but we still have that peripteral colonnade. So if you're really far away, it might be hard to tell um, where the entrance is. Uh, the Corinthian order here on these capitals, so very ornate, decorative. We also see that frieze is still intact. Um, you can see the carving, the relief carving on the frieze there. Um, uh, the uh, a note about the Corinthian also is that if you're 
building a temple like this that is viewed from all angles. Um, the Corinthian is also one you might want to use because it's it's the most striking from far away. It's sort of the most beautiful, I guess, from far away. Um, and so if you're, you're building something to be seen from all angles or from far away, like the fact that this is on sort of a cliff top, um, like the Tholos at Delphi was, um, that is going to, you might want to use the Corinthian order because then from far away, people will be able to see that ornamentation because it's the most ornamented, there's the most going on. So, um, Another note why they might have used uh, Corinthian. Uh, this one is also made of uh, travertine um, for uh, I think the columns and the, the base, uh, but the cella, so the interior portion, um, is concrete. And this is a huge development. The uh, Roman development of concrete probably changed the course of architectural history forever. <laughs> um, the fact that they are using concrete and it's such a durable material, that's why we have so much preserved from the Romans a lot is their use of concrete. Um, it's, I mean, you see concrete throughout history and especially now imagine how much of our world is built with concrete. Um, so this was a huge, um, huge development. Um, so the wall of the cella here is made of concrete. Um, uh, this is not a Greek feature, so I guess I said this is as Greek as it gets, but uh, concrete is not a Greek feature. That is a Roman development, so they're sort of adapting Greek temples here and using their own materials. Like they, I said, they were using the travertine, um, also using uh, concrete. Um, the reason that they turned to concrete is that they had the realization it would be easier to shape uh, interesting shapes <laughs> out of concrete. So concrete is a little more um, flexible or forgiving. And so you can you can build that circle, that circle shape out of concrete. It's easier to build it out of concrete than it would be to use uh, marble. So that was the main reason that they turned to concrete or started uh, experimenting with it. It's a very expressive material. Um, but the thing about concrete is that it is not watertight. So it would always be faced with something. So here, Let's get this right, okay? So there's cella. The cella is made of concrete. That inner circle here is made of concrete. To make it watertight, they have to face it with something. So what they face it with is this, which you can see really, it's a bit small. I couldn't find a great picture, but they face it with these little stones, this, this sort of stone uh, facing. And the, the technique that we call this is opus incertum opus and kertum. And that's really important here. So here's a close up. This is what it would look like. It's so when you opus and kertum is when you have a lot of little stones and you're piecing them together like a puzzle. So it's not like ashlar masonry, right? Remember ashlar masonry on the, the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus? That they had cut the stone, cut them into these perfect bricks or, or slabs, and then pieced them together. And it was like perfect. It was very uniform, very, um, yeah, well fit together. Here, we don't have that. Here, we're just taking a bunch of little stones and trying to piece them together. Um, and it almost creates sort of a mosaic look. And so there's a lot of different ways that the Romans faced their concrete, lots of different things like this. And we'll talk about more as um, it goes on, but you'll hear it always, always starts with opus. So that refers to some sort of a facing or um, a wall material, right? Um, so what you would do is when the concrete was still wet, you would take these small stones and you would place it into it, right? And it's supposed to make it more um, watertight uh, and more stone-like also. Um, so a big, a big um, development there for the Romans. Another thing about that we can see in this picture is the coffering on the ceiling. So you'd see these coffers. That's going to become another big Roman element. Um, those are those squares, and they're sort of 3D squares. So they have different tiers to them that give them a lot of dimension and a lot of texture. And then in the middle, there's that floral medallion as sort of a decorative element, these rosettes, you can call them. But it gives the impression of depth so that when you're looking up into the ceiling, you're not just looking at this this straight uh, wall, you know, straight roof, um, but there's depth there. It makes it feel bigger. It's more interesting. Um, so you, that's as done with those coffers. Uh, so next up, the Sanctuary of Hercules. I know we're just like going through all this architecture. I told you it would be an architecture heavy lecture. So <laughs> I'm true to my word. Um, Sanctuary of Hercules. So this is also in Tivoli. So the same place that the Temple of Vesta that we just looked at is. Um, and this is something that we're going to start seeing a lot of are these sanctuaries. So you don't just have a temple, but you have this whole temple complex and you have a lot of different features here, right? So this is the Sanctuary of Hercules. Um, do you remember a couple slides ago? Temple to a hero. 
is a Harun, right? Um, so that's going to be what this is also, uh, circa 50 BC. Um, it is a huge uh, a Mecca, sort of a, a pilgrimage site for religious activity, for tourism. So a lot of people would come from Rome and from across the empire um, to, to visit this, this site, this religious site. Um, and a, a, a big feature that facilitated that is this, there we go, this road that you see that went directly uh, through it. It's called the Via Tibertina, the Via Tibertina. And the Via Tibertina led all the way to Rome. So <laughs> you might've heard, what's the common expression, right? All roads lead to Rome. Um, true in some sense, actually. There's some definitely truth in that, that they built this massive road network all across the empire. And so in Tivoli, we have this road that if you kept going on it, it would actually lead you all the way back to Rome. Uh, so again, facilitating pilgrimages, tourism, stuff like that. Um, so the temple in the center, right? So that would be the temple to Hercules. Um, it is it, uh, in these sanctuaries, the temples are usually backed against a wall and then they have that big open area out in front uh so we have that temple in the back against the wall um it is uh, uh looks more like the um temple of portunus right so it looks more roman we have a, a, a very frontal access to it is it oh is it peripteral or pseudo peripteral i think it's pseudo peripteral but i could be wrong I might have to look that up, but we definitely see that big staircase. Um, it's sitting on this massive podium. There's almost actually two staircases there, right? Um, so uh, we have that in the back. Um, and then we also have this uh, uh, sort of theater element. Um, and so it wasn't, it was also not just a, um, religious center, but there was also a, the theater element where people could sit, watch performances, or maybe also watch religious ceremonies. Um, temples don't really hold a lot of people, you know? Um, they're not really meant actually for, for indoor um, ceremonies, as maybe I've mentioned before. Uh, the temples, it was usually more outdoor. Uh, you would do it in front. That's why it's frontally oriented, right? Because you're going to do the ritual outside. Um, so in this case, you need to seat a lot of people maybe who want to watch these religious ceremonies. So they've built this theater we're going to talk a little bit more about theaters later on when we get to some better examples. Um, but there it is today. I think it's pretty kind of heavily restored. Um, not a ton, a ton left from this one. Um, uh, so there would have been a stage there, though, where you could watch it. Um, and then we also see something that is going to become huge, 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 huge. OK, <laughs> pay attention if you're not right now. Um, we talked about the development of concrete, right? Concrete was huge in a huge development for Roman architecture. The one that we see here is the arch, and the arch is another huge development in Roman architecture. Um, good, okay, I have this image. So let's go over this. So a Roman arch started out in its most simple form on the left, an arch. You have these blocks that are pieced together, and um, actually though, what you start at is the keystone. So the keystone is that central block that's gonna hold the whole thing together, okay? Um, so you have the keystone and you have this arch. From the arch, we are going to then expand. And what you're going to do is you're going to keep building. You have that keystone in the middle. And if you look here, it's like perfectly straight, that keystone. See how those like link together really well? So you have a keystone and then you're going to have a barrel vault, right? And these, I'm sure you've seen a million of them. They're all over the place nowadays. Uh, but you have this, this gateway, this hallway um, that is created by the use of this barrel vault. And that's going to be a rounded um, arch that creates a hallway. Later on, I'm not going to talk much about this today. Later on, though, you'll start connecting. So we just keep adding to this, right? We start with a really simple arch, and then we go to a barrel vault, and then we go to the groin vault, which is almost like two intersecting barrel vaults. And where they intersect is on that groin, that kind of X shape at the top. Um, and like I said, this um, we're not going to talk about much because this was a later development. So right now we're just looking at the arch and the barrel vault, but I wanted to bring that up because this is where things are going. Um, and it just became such an important part of, of architecture, really. And, if you, you know, medieval art, especially, you'll see tons of barrel vaults and churches and things. So a really important development here. I want to go back to this, though. So what you see is those so here we have a massive uh, looks like, you know, arch and a barrel vault, but especially in this, uh, these, these porticos along along the open area, um, we have these arches and that would be a barrel vault inside it. So arches on the outside as well. And then this long barrel vault where you can walk, you can stroll, etc. Um, yeah, so it would be an, you have an arcade of columns, an arcade of barrel vaults. 
Um, uh, you can't see it here, but it would have been opus and keratum. Oh, maybe you can. Oh, I take that back. Here we go. Up at the top, you can see some. And then in those columns, I think that's opus and keratum too. It's really hard to see, but I'm pretty sure that is. Um, so the uh, same type of thing in those columns there. Interesting, they use columns, but they're not actually supporting anything. So the weight is all resting on that vault. That vault is the thing carrying the weight and those arches are bearing the weight, but they still have columns to um, maybe give you a sense of security as a decorative element. Also, um, the columns are made of concrete as well. They're not made of stone. So this is all concrete um, faced with the opus and kertum. Um, and uh, also in these sort of niches, right? So in those uh, types of archways, you might have shops as well. So as you're walking down the barrel vault, you could stop at these shops. So this whole sanctuary was almost in a way like uh, almost like a forum, really, because it's it's it has all of these different elements. It has commercial, it has religious, uh, even some entertainment with the uh, theater. So really, a huge tourist pilgrimage site that uses a lot of uh, architectural developments in in Roman architecture. A similar one we're going to look at. A similar type of sanctuary, so still a tourism site, a pilgrimage site, is the sanctuary of Fortuna Primigenia in Preneste, which is just south of Rome. So uh, this dates to about 120. So again, um, if you're living in Rome, you know, easy access, you could go um, and visit on a pilgrimage or tourist trip. Uh, this is what it looks like today with a lot of <laughs> older architecture or um, later architecture, I should say. Um, so a lot of stuff that is not Roman, but you can see the general shape of it here. So note that when I show you the diagram in a second, there's this general ramp. And then we have these arches, archways, these um, niches, right? And then we have these barrel vaults that go through, right? And then we have a long staircase also that's going to lead up to the top of it. And that's good. So what we're looking at here is right here in the center, right? Um, did you say anything else about that? No, okay. So yes, the rabbit's right. Getting situated here. <laughs> so the uh, something to notice about this one, and especially if we compare it to this. So this is a flat platform, right? So um, there are steps that lead up to it, but uh, it's generally sort of just raised above the ground. What we see here is terracing. And that is why we have those ramps. That's why we have these different levels, right? Look at how many levels. I mean, you start here, and you just keep going up, right? And this idea of a terraced type of sanctuary comes from the Greeks. So that's why we have this, I'm dragging my memory. <laughs> so this is Pergamon. It's in modern day Turkey, but at that time we consider that part of the world, all part of the Greek world. It had this shared Greek culture, right? Um, so uh, it was a Hellenistic kingdom. So um, Hellenistic kingdoms in the wake of Alexander the Great uh, were ruled by sort of people associated with that, that conquest. Um, so it was a Hellenistic kingdom. It had a lot of power, especially in the second century. Um, and the last king there um, <laughs> wills his kingdom to Rome. So I'm not sure if he read the writing on the wall or thought it might be conquered or what, but he doesn't leave it to an heir. He leaves it to Rome. He leaves his entire kingdom to the city of Rome or the empire, I guess it's starting to be now. So uh, Rome take control, takes control of it. And we think that that might be where they got the idea for this uh, terraced structure that we see closer to the city of Rome at, um, the, at uh, Preneste. So um, important things to note here, right? So it's built on that terrace system again. So we see these multiple levels, um, this crazy like theater uh, in the middle. Um, you can see that on the map, super like steep leading down into the hills, um, really built, uh, it's very, very hilly area. So really built for the landscape, built with that landscape in mind, making innovations for the landscape. Um, it uh, was similar in ways also to Greek city design. So it had agora uh, and had uh, multiple agoras, I think, um, which are sort of like the forum of the Greek world. Um, uh, and the way that they would do it, yes, they would terrace it and then they would build flat. You terrace it and then you build it flat, right? And that creates um, a city that works on a hill. So when we go back to Preneste, um, uh, we see here's, so here's what it would have looked like in, um, in reality, right? So not with all of those other uh, buildings that came in the medieval period and beyond. Um, so here's what it would have looked like in the Roman period. So again, we see those ramps that lead up to it, um, the staircase, um, and these just super long uh, barrel vaults, right? That we'll see go back. Um, we have a, a, a colonnade that goes around this courtyard, multiple levels of the terracing again. And then at the very top crowning the structure, we have a tholos, right? So again, 
if it is a Greek, if the terracing system is a Greek sort of city design, it is topped by a tholos, which is a Greek temple design. So looking very Greek, and again, coming from the fact that Rome is beginning to acquire uh, territory. Uh, you know, we, have, we had Corinth, and now we see Pergamon, that Rome is starting to acquire these Greek territories, and so they're incorporating Greek design into their own design. Um, see, a couple other things. Um, also uses concrete, right? Uh, this would have been much harder to do if you had to cut the stone to build this. I mean, I think almost impossible. So the fact that they had this concrete as a development enables this whole system to work. Um, we see also uh, Opus and Kertum there. Uh, you can see that here, see those stones. So that would have been concrete and then it's based with these stones. Um, and I think it really also creates a sense of um, theatricality. So it's a very theatrical type of almost uh, performance that you're putting your guests through. So the fact that this was a pilgrimage site, a tourism site, um, there is almost, uh, yeah, a sense of, of theater to it. You know, imagine if you go to Disneyland or something, right? They create these spaces that are supposed to influence the way that you experience the space. And they're making these intentionally almost odd type of spaces because it's, it creates an experience. And so that's what we're seeing here. And that's especially done through the use of t alternating tunnels and then open space. So what we're seeing there is that there's these really dark tunnels that would almost have put you in the dark. And then all of a sudden you're in this super bright, sunny open space, right? So that contrast really um, creates this sense of reveal. There's like, as I said, it's a theatrical moment where there's the big reveal once you step out of this tunnel and you see the views maybe, you see the new level that you're on. Um, it's very experiential. Also, like I said, the shift in elevation. So as you raise, if you go higher, you see more of the view, you're on a different level, um, these changing experiences. So it's all sort of all stagecraft, right? Um, and it's also very calculated where there are these certain walkways that go certain places and um, the architect is almost telling you where to walk. Uh, they're telling you how they want you to experience this space. So very complex, um, very experiential, um, this is not just a simple building. The Romans are really doing something complex, really trying to create an experience for people. So that was a lot of architecture, as I said, <laughs> and we will be looking at more, um, but I want to change a little bit because I think I've, I've hammered home, right, those developments of, of concrete, of huge Greek influence, right? So I want to move a little bit more now toward the historical context. So um, here's where we are. So here's like a map of, of Rome um, and you see it started at the city and then uh, the Punic Wars. I think I mentioned last time the Pyrrhic War. So after the Pyrrhic War came the Punic Wars, which were initially fought over Sicily, over the island here um, in Southern Italy, but then uh, expanded to a, a larger war and ended up with, uh, with Rome taking Spain, um, taking parts up here, um, this was a long drawn out battle with Carthage. Um, so they took part of North Africa as well. There's Carthage, right? The Battle of Zama, a huge, huge battle. Um, so they, that's how they start acquiring uh, more territory at the Punic War. Um, the territory in Asia Minor, so 133 BC, that's what I was just mentioning. Pergamon, there you see it on the map. So uh, yeah, technically in Turkey, but part of the Greek world. Um, and then the next big event that we're going to come to and the event that we're going to talk about, uh, 44 BC, the death of Julius Caesar. So um, there we go. So by the first century, uh, actually, let me go back to this for just a second. So by the first century, um, you can see that Rome is having to deal with a lot more than it has ever dealt with before. So it's no longer just ruling Italy, it's no longer just ruling the city of Rome, but it's it's conquered so much territory that it's putting a strain on the Senate, on the Republic, and it's impacting the ability of the government to, to govern such a, a large empire and to keep track of everything. Um, and what also was happening, happening that I talked about um, last time, which started very early on in, in the Republic, uh, was the rise of these aristocratic, very military focused families. So I mentioned people, um, you know, like that tomb that we saw, right? Q Fabius, um, people like him who were gaining power, were gaining wealth, were gaining influence, uh, entering the, aristocr the aristocracy through 
military means. So military successes, they would go out to uh, Spain, you know, as part of the Punic War or whatever, um, and have a great uh, uh, victory. They'd come back to the city of Rome and they'd have a, a triumph, which is a parade in their honor. They would um, show off the spoils of war, you know, things that they'd taken back from Corinth. Uh, you know, Lucius Mummius would have had a triumph and displayed everything he took through the city. And that, I mean, imagine the fame that that gives you, right? You can think about it like after uh, the Super Bowl, after the World Series, right? Uh, they always go back to the hometown and the team gets on these buses and they parade through the city. And I mean, those guys are like gods almost, right? <laughs> like they're just on top of the world. And so that's how these, these military commanders became um, and they really started gaining power. And so uh, another thing is that the structure of this very militaristic society, I mean, if you, if you think about it, uh, the amount of time spent um, as a soldier for a lot of men, you know, it was that the culture was all focused around all of these battles that were always taking place all over the Mediterranean. And what happens is, is that the, each army starts becoming very loyal to their commander. So uh, you're almost not identifying as much with the Senate, who's sitting hundreds of miles away, you know, on the Capitoline Hill. Um, yes, they're your, they're your government, but you're in Spain, you're in Gaul, you're in Syria, um, and you are following this, this very uh, successful sort of inspiring military leader. And so these armies start getting, uh, they're becoming more loyal to their generals than the state. And this is gonna create major problems. Um, there's also the issue of, of money and that uh, the better that you did uh, the, in, in battle, uh, your, your general sort of uh, decided your pay. So your pay was, that was, that was a more of a local thing. Um, you weren't paid by the state. Um, and so it was like, if you, if guys go out and you have this massive victory, you get to keep more spoils. So they're going to follow the money um, as well, these armies, they're definitely going to follow the money. And if, uh, if one commander can continue to succeed, they're going to keep following him because they know that they're going to keep getting spoils of war. So that really changes the culture and causes problems. So uh, what it leads to is the first triumvirate. Uh, uh, there's a lot of history here. <laughs> and this is unfortunately not a strictly history class or strictly political history class. So I'm going to uh, go through it briefly, but it's important to understand because you need to understand the art of that era. So the first triumvirate, basically they uh, moved to a system where they were trying to have this, this power through these an alliance, right? So there's an alliance of these three men, Pompey the Great, Julius Caesar, and Crassus. And um, so this alliance between the three of them was, uh, they were all co military commanders, right? So like I said, they were those great generals who would have had armies following them. Um, Crassus was actually the wealthiest man in Rome at the time. Um, and then Pompey was uh, a big in the Eastern Mediterranean. So he, with his armies, had rid the Eastern Mediterranean of pirates um, and uh, therefore become very, you know, beloved, famous, um, very powerful from that. Um, so he really, yeah, had a long, uh, distinguished military career. Uh, statues of him go up at the Roman Forum. Um, and we can look a little bit about how he is presenting himself through his portraits, right? So he looks uh, sort of serene here. There's sort of a calmness to his face. Again, I'm talking about this one on the left. Um, there's sort of a sereneness. It's sort of fleshy a little bit. So um, he looks older in a way because he has the lines on the top, right? So he has those lines on his forehead. Um, that maybe mark him as a somewhat uh, uh, older or more dignified man, um, but his face is still a little bit uh, fleshy. But he looks, he has a wisdom about him and I think a calmness. Um, and maybe that does point to who, uh, the way that he's trying to present himself, right, as a leader. The fact that as uh, this leader, he's, he's calm, he's in control, he's wise. Uh, he looks like someone you could trust, right? <laughs> so, and again, also that that hair, uh, sort of the longer hair, uh, that's also a reference to his time in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, it sort of mimics Alexander the Great's hair. Um, and so that's a reference also to his, his victories in the Hellenistic kingdoms. Um, uh, in 62 BC, he throws one of the biggest triumphs ever in Rome uh, after his uh, defeat of uh, Mithridates, who uh, was a Hellenistic uh, ruler in the East. And so for this, he gets a massive triumph, right? One of those huge parades. Um, and he also ends up building 
the Theater of Pompey and the Campus Martius in Rome. So uh, this is gonna be the next uh, big piece of work we're gonna look at. So again, if I have you here in the city of Rome, right? Um, Palatine Hill, there's the Forum Boarium, you know where that is now, Forum Romanum. We're kind of here on the outskirts, the Theater of Pompey. And this was really important because uh, theaters were actually permanent theaters were not allowed to be built in Rome at this time. So anytime that you wanted to have a performance, you would have to build a new theater. You'd have to erect a theater, a, re a theater from scratch, essentially a temporary one. Um, and the reason that this was is because they were worried about having really big open spaces. Um, this was sort of a time of turmoil in the Roman Empire and they thought that if we have this big permanent just open gathering space that could fit tons and tons of people that's there all the time um it would lead to riots and uprising and it would be a place for people who want to riot and who want to uh you know perhaps uh create violence or something um they would create a place for them to congregate and for them to plan and create start these riots so uh, it was politically risky essentially to have permanent uh, theaters in rome and so they were banned until that is Pompey comes along and he decides that to make his mark, you know, to show even more so his power, his influence, he's going to erect this giant theater for the people, right? This is a, this is a people's monument. And what he does to ensure that there will be no rioting um, or any, you know, type of, of nefarious means of using this is he puts a temple in it. So there's a temple to, uh, to Venus Victress, Victrix, uh, which is the Venus of, of victory sort of associated, right? Again, referencing his great military success. So his thinking is that if you put a temple in the theater complex, people won't riot because you wouldn't desecrate a temple that way, right? This is, this is now sort of a pious place. So everyone needs to behave and be on their best behavior. Um, the other thing that he puts in is a curia. So a curia, as I said, uh, that was the Senate house in the Roman forum. They also have a curia that you see here. That is this one at the back. So you have this big uh, theater complex, you have the temple, and then you have a big open space um, where you can stroll, there's a portico, sort of a peristyle of columns, right? And then the curia at the back. Um, you can also see here in the back a few more, these would have been more temples. So a few more temples. So he's almost creating uh, like a sanctuary, like we've seen, right? It's a similar type thing. It wasn't necessarily called sanctuary because the emphasis here was on the theater, um, but uh, it sort of has elements of those sanctuaries that we've seen. So here, yeah, just another view of it, um, sort of able to see into the theater more. And then here's a cool view where, you know, if you would have been looking at it, it's very impressive, very grand, um, multiple levels. So uh, its presence and its connection to Pompey would have really marked him as a powerful figure. Um, and again, donating this for the people, right? You know, there's things that people would need. We see latrines, you know, toilets, things like that, things that people would need if they were to come to the theater um, for a show. So uh, uh, definitely sort of a, a public uh, 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 benefaction here, but also one that is directly linked to Pompey. I want to say a little bit more about the theater structure. I think I mentioned we were going to go into this. So um, some terms that you might need to know um, about a common theater. And again, theater is coming from the Greek. Um, this is also a Greek um, a feature, architectural feature. Um, and you know, the, the, the long legacy of Greek plays and all of that, uh, very, very Greek thing to have a theater. So the temple we have at the top there, uh, uh, Venus Victrix, uh, the cavia is these seats here. So that's like where the, the people would sit when they're watching uh, the show, uh, the orchestra, right? So again, uh, you probably can infer what that is from um, uh, modern theaters, right? So we have the orchestra down in front. Uh, the pulpitum is this sort of stage, uh, the stage itself. And then the skene fronds is this giant massive uh, structure at the back of the stage. And it's sort of the backdrop of the stage. Um, and these can be really elaborate, really decorative. As you can see, you can see these Corinthian columns on these, these massive uh, bases, um, really sort of an elaborate, beautiful thing to, to look at behind the, uh, the performance taking place, uh, sort of like a backdrop. So those are uh, some terms for, for theater construction. And these are common, you'll see them, all, of, all theaters always have this kind of stuff. Um, just something else interesting to look at here. So if we 
um, look at the, the complex the archaeological remains compared to what is there today. Uh, it's really interesting how the city of Rome continues its legacy from the ancient era. So if you look at where this round part where it, right of the theater would have been, um, it mimics today, you can see where that would have been. See that curve? So that's the same curve. The, the, the modern city mimics what would have been there in ancient times, um, which I think was just an, a natural development of um, when things get built over, you know, similar, the same forms are maybe used. Um, and then also the road, you see a road here and there's a road that goes there. That would be the same one. So you can kind of get a sense of, of the scale of it, um, just like that. So a bit interesting. And then I think, uh, yeah, the, um, uh, oh, sorry, I was wrong. This is the road. This is the road because these are the temple ruins. So these buildings, the ruins of them are there because you can see the circle um, of the tholos and the circle there. So that's the road. Um, so that's Pompey. Um, Pompey is actually assassinated. Um, uh, do I have the date here? Uh, do not, but uh, Pompey gets assassinated um, as many people do in this time. Um, and uh, again, um, just to, to briefly sort of, of give you the historical context here, um, the power starts shifting in Caesar's favor. So Caesar uh, was a military general, like I said, one of those really charismatic, uh, strong leaders, had a lot of military success, specifically in Gaul, in the region of, of France today. So he had achieved a lot of fame and fortune and a very loyal following in an army. Um, his army was very loyal to him. And um, essentially he gets so powerful um, that, and people think that he's going to become an emperor, right? Um, and he starts marching back to the city of Rome and people are getting nervous because they're thinking, you know, he's there to take it over. And so they prohibit him from returning to Rome with the army. They say, you can come in, but you need to leave the army outside because that is an act of war essentially. He doesn't listen, comes into Rome anyway, um, there with the army. Uh, there's a civil war uh, uh, which turns in his favor and he is proclaimed dictator for life. And this is unprecedented because the idea of a dictator was uh, something in Roman politics. So in times of emergency, um, if you've seen the Star Wars prequels, you can think back to that. Um, there, there is a, a crisis and they have to elect one of their consuls as, as dictator because they need more stability. Um, and so they, uh, and they also need things to happen quickly. They can't wait for the Senate to decide. So they proclaim this person dictator so that he can make all the decisions just in time of emergency and then he'll give the power back. And um, Pompey actually held that position um, <coughs> excuse me, um, for uh, a bit of time when he was consul, he was proclaimed dictator, but he then gave um, his power back. Caesar, on the other hand, when he is proclaimed a dictator, he is proclaimed dictator for life. So there is no idea that he might give his power back. He is now the sole ruler for life. Um, this was again, unprecedented and outraging to a lot of people. Because if you think back to 509, to the beginnings of the Republic, and the story of Lucretia's death and Brutus uh, taking the dagger out of her body and raising it in the sky and proclaiming that there will never be another king in Rome, right? This idea in the Roman mindset that we are so against kings that one man cannot have all the power, right? This is a Republic. So that was a deeply held conviction and um, the fact that Julius Caesar is now uh, going against that is proclaiming himself a uh, dictator for life um, and essentially calling himself uh, an emperor, but really he's a king. And so um, this is a huge uh, point of contention in Roman society. Um, and I'm sure you know what happens next. That is his assassination. He is actually assassinated at the Curia at the theater of Pompey. So um, what I just showed you, he goes there for a Senate session, um, and that is when he is assassinated on the Ides of March in 44 BC, uh, March 15th, 44 BC. Um, however, there were many people who supported him. He had a lot of supporters, um, and there was uh, almost immediately after his death, he was proclaimed a god. Um, and so we'll start to see that as we go throughout um, Roman history and uh, into the empire that we have a lot of references to the divine Julius Caesar because he was essentially deified upon his death. Um, 
his death did not end the civil strife in Rome, as we will see moving forward, but I do want to talk about him and uh, his life at the moment. So um, let's look a little bit at his portraits. So we see him on coins. He was actually the first uh, uh, person to, uh, uh, first politician, I guess I should say, to put himself on coins. Um, so uh, this is a coin with him and you see that he looks a bit thinner uh, than Pompey, right? He has, you can see sort of his cheekbones more. He has uh, sunken cheeks a little bit. He doesn't have that sort of fleshiness that Pompey has. Um, so he looks maybe a little bit fitter also. Um, and he doesn't look, he, well, he looks wise, right? But he also looks strong. He looks athletic, um, especially in the portrait that we have on the right, um, his, his uh, stone portrait here. Um, he looks uh, tough, I would say, tougher than Pompey, right? There's sort of a hardness to, uh, to him. His, his, uh, his, his brow is sort of furrowed. He has these strong features, the cheekbones that you can see, um, a distinctive chin, that, that kind of larger nose also. Um, and he's also, yeah, as I said, thinner and fitter. So what we see here is a very athletic um, military leader. Right? This is someone who would be good in battle. Um, Pompey, although he is wise, although he looks very serene and calm, um, you don't necessarily picture him as being the biggest athlete on the battlefield. Um, but Julius Caesar, that's what we're seeing here. He also styles himself after Hellenistic kings, um, specifically Ptolemy. And you see the, um, uh, the headband that he wears there. That is a Hellenistic ornament. Um, it's quite a, sort of here in his, in his head, on his head. Um, and also this is a individualized portrait, right? So we're not, um, it's not a generalized portrait. We're not just sort of making a, a generic man <laughs> and calling it Julius Caesar. Um, it's a very uh, uh, individualized type of portraiture. And that's what we're also going to see moving forward. Um, these, these portraits that get commissioned um, and in a very specific way, certain attributes that are added to uh, de depict someone in, in the way that they want to be depicted, right? Whether or not Julius Caesar looked like this, we don't know, right? We have other portraits of him. Um, and as you can see, like these two, if you compare them, they look fairly similar. But there is, at least at, least at this time, some sort of element of ide idealization a little bit. So he's trying to look a certain way, um, trying to look uh, you know, powerful, strong, all of these things, right? The other thing that um, Caesar is going to do that is a massive part of his legacy um, in, in terms of, of architecture and urban development is that he builds his own forum. So the Forum Iulium was begun in 54 BC and dedicated in 46, so it took, took a few years to build. Um, and I have it for you here. So here's the city of Rome, right? Um, this is actually the Google map, so I like showing different types of uh, different depictions of the city, right? Because uh, then you can kind of learn where everything is. So here's the Forum Barium, Bo Boarium there. Uh, we have the Forum Romanum, Capitoline Hill. And then there is the Forum Iulium. So that's where he's gonna build his forum. It's gonna be right between um, the Capitoline Hill and the, uh, or right at the base of the Capitoline Hill and directly next to the Forum Romanum. Um, and this is really important because previously we only had uh, the Forum Boarium and the Forum Romanum, which were both Republican um, uh, fora, and they were uh, created not by one person, right? So they were kind of created by the state. Here we have one person, we have um, the, uh, the ruler who he'll end up being, um, making his own forum. And this is going to really become common for Roman emperors. We're going to see tons of Roman emperors build their own fora in the city. Um, and that really builds up the city. So uh, let's look at his a little bit. So um, similar to uh, Pompey, he builds a curia, a Senate house, uh, reference you know, to politics uh, and his, his place as a position or as a politician. Um, he wants to have a meeting house in his own forum. Um, we have a, a peristyle here of columns, right? So columns that go all the way around, um, sort of it's a sort of actually um, frontally oriented almost because we almost have a porch here, like a pronaus. Um, so it's sort of, and then it's leading up to this temple, right? This temple in the back, um, which is a temple to Venus Genetrix. Um, and that is a reference to his divinity. So it was said that he was a descendant of Aeneas, who was another founder of Rome. Um, Aeneas was someone who was in the Trojan War and then comes over um, to Rome and eventually founds it and his descendants uh, along the lines are <laughs> Rom Romulus and Remus. Um, and Aeneas was, uh, a, a, Venus was his sort of um, divine parent. 
So um, the fact that Julius Caesar is trying to say that he is also related to Aeneas means that he is also related to Venus, the goddess um, Aphrodite in Greek. So he builds a temple to her to again make that connection that he is part of a divine lineage, that he has this goddess's favor, so don't mess with him, right? Uh, it looks like a very Roman temple, so we have that frontal entry. Um, it is, uh, uh, doesn't go, the columns don't go all the way around. Um, uh, there is a Corinthian order here, right? So if you look at the columns, uh, they have Corinthian capitals here. Um, this is sort of uh, a little bit of a better picture. I was going to show you, try to show you what that rectangular cornice looks like. Um, and that one, you can see it a little bit, how it doesn't, the, the roof doesn't, the roof kind of feels like it stops right here, and then there's the cornice. Um, it's a bit hard to see. Um, a couple other things that this uh, would have had. Um, uh, uh, the Curia also, um, this is also a place for the people though. So there was shops, there was latrines, again, a sort of public architecture that they are building, right? That he is building as a gift to the city to sort of win people's favor, to remind people of his power, his influence, the fact that he can afford to build a forum, um, all of these things. So um, as I said, it's an extension of the, the um, Republican forum and it'll lead to a lot more of the emperor's following to build their own fora. So, <laughs> Uh, he is assassinated, as I said, in 44 BC, and that uh, is not the end of the struggles, uh, the civic civil struggles in Rome. Uh, a sort of power vacuum is created between Octavian Augustus and Mark Antony, and um, we will talk next time about the rise of Octavian Augustus, and Augustus is going to get his whole week. So both uh, lectures this week will cover Augustan Rome uh, because he is a huge, huge figure. Um, I would argue even, even more so than Julius Caesar. He has a long reign. He's emperor for quite a while and he sets the precedent for what a Roman emperor is to do, is to be like, the way that they should depict themselves. All of these things stem from Augustus who was, uh, you know, in my mind, really the first emperor because he's really setting the stage for everyone who's gonna come after him. We also see the beginning of an empire. So a change in the political system, um, creating it as an empire with an emperor, but also even more expansion. Rome is going to continuously add new territories for the next couple hundred years. Um, and also in terms of uh, architectural features um, and just the building of the empire also, uh, Augustus plays a huge, huge role in that. In, in building up the actual city of Rome and in, in building a lot of things that make it uh, what it what it is at its height. So very important. Um, and from here on out, we are looking at the empire, um, and we'll be looking at the emperors and um, and how they dealt with governing and how they depicted themselves as part of their propaganda and how they um, they built things for the public and across. We'll also be starting to move really outside of Italy um, and looking at things in other parts of the empire. So a lot of exciting stuff coming up. Um, and uh, leave it there for now, and then we'll see you next week with the rise of Augustus.